Very and cool. she had. Uh, Court TV is still in existence. It's still, well, it's now called True TV, and they have some courtroom stuff, but, it's, it but it's not like it was. Yeah, I knew Which it was, was really heavily you know, gavel to gavel news coverage and yep. uh, uh, anchors that were legal experts. Yeah. And, you know. Okay. Yeah. Hello, and welcome to Media Reporter. I'm Megan Alone. With us today is a man who's helped one of his clients off <laughs> death row and all without a law degree. Lonnie Surrey is a media expert and founder of falseconfessions.org. And he's with us here today. Lonnie, thanks thank for joining us. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. So can you explain for our viewers a little bit more about what you do? Well, you know, it's very apparent in sort of 2012 the importance of a public voice in legal cases. Because cases, you know, they're in many ways, they, uh, especially high-profile cases, the, the word is, uh, you know, the court of public opinion. And I think more and more, especially as a society has become more verbal, television, media, uh, cases are decided outside of the courtroom or at least influences outside of the courtroom. Previously, in most cases, whether they're civil or, or criminal, the only voice was the prosecutors. You know, prosecutors had connections to the media, prosecutors had connections to, to other uh, public uh, voices out there. But the defense, because of combination of factors of lawyers being intimidated by the media as well as uh, not wanting to talk, afraid of judges, et cetera, et cetera, really had no voice. And in, in fact, defendants, uh, you know, whether the guilty or innocent, and I work on many wrongful convictions, there was nobody who explained the case, nobody to put the facts out there except the prosecutor. So it was really one sided. If you look at the newspaper, every case is public. And I recently spoke before a legal defense group, and I said it's akin to malpractice if a lawyer in this day and age does not have a public strategy. I'm not saying your, your client should be out there speaking to the press, but from the moment that crime is committed, from the moment that person is arrested, it's in the newspapers. We all look at, look at the police blotter in every local newspaper to see which neighbor of ours got the DWI. <laughs> and whether they're guilty or innocent, their name is in there. So as a lawyer, you better have a public strategy. So in a sense, you're kind of defending the defenseless only without a law degree, really. <laughs> well, in some ways, we're, you know, I consider myself an advocate or a public advocate, and I do public advocacy, whether if it's for, it's for a client in a legal case or a client that, that's hired me to, to give them voice, and, and that's exactly what it is. In the wrongful conviction cases I've worked on, most recently Damian Eccles, now uh, Richard DeGugliamo in Westchester or Jesse Friedman in Long Island, uh, often, in Richard's case, he's in prison. Damien Eccles was on death row, death row. He had no voice or very limited. So in many ways, I become their voice. I try to, to get the issues of their innocence or the issues, uh, the legal issues out there to the public. Because I, you know, as, as the prosecutor in Damien Eccles said, case said about me, I poisoned the jury pool. <laughs> so he said, I had to, had to settle. He poisoned the jury pool. What I say is I educated the public. I want to make sure that judge or that law clerk or, or that judge's friend at the country club knows facts about this case because that's how they're often decided, unfortunately. Yeah. So this is kind of a very specialized field, I would think. What led you to kind of get into it? Well, I've always worked in my practice on media relations on high-profile legal cases. And I was somebody who was always interested in law and always interested in, in social justice. So when you talk about justice, then you take it to the courtroom, and the question is, do we have justice? Is this country, you know, we talk about the best legal system in the world, but really is it? Are, are, are defendants treated fairly? Or, you know, why are there so many wrongful convictions? What happens? Where does it break down? And why is, there, why is it necessary to have another voice? And in fact, what works best is on wrongful conviction cases or high-profile legal cases, in which when you have the attorneys and you have the, let's say, the media consultant or the public advocacy consultant and you have the family all working together to fight the case and in some ways it's uh, David versus Goliath whether it's a case I, I represented the estate of J.R. Tolkien in a, in a huge battle against New Line Cinema over rights to the, to the uh, Lord of the Rings films so it's kind of David versus Goliath and that's part of it. Yeah absolutely. I'm assuming that since you, you know, work so closely with defendants who are very often in prison, that you must have a good deal of interaction with lawyers and judges and stuff like that on a very regular basis. So how is it that you are able to kind of influence their, the effects that they have on... Well, I think, you know, I think probably the best way to look at it is, is through a case. And right now I'm working on a case in, in Westchester County of a, young, of a man named Richard DeGugliamo, who was 
wrongfully convicted of uh, what's called depraved indifference murder back in 1996. He was a police officer who found uh, a, a man who, who, after an argument with a guy in the parking lot, uh, a man took a baseball bat out and was beating his father over the head with the baseball bat. And Richard being off duty, the only thing he could do to try to stop this violent crime was unfortunately to intervene and he shot the man. And Richard was, the witnesses at the crime scene all said Richard had no, you know, it was his duty to stop this, this, this essentially murder of his father. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, by the time the police and prosecutors got that afternoon, they were already charging Richard, an NYPD decorated officer, with assault, murder, second degree murder, and what was called depraved indifference to human life, as if he didn't care. The New York Court of Appeals has stated that you can't now prosecute both. Right. Right? You either intentional murder, and Richard said, I did intentionally. I was trained as a police officer. Yeah. In fact, what happened was, 11 years after serving uh, in prison, Richard was found innocent. His case was completely overturned by the judge, who found that prosecutors had coerced witnesses into making false testimony. And the judge threw out the case. Richard was freed. And he got married, he got a new job, his family finally, the right thing happened. And then the prosecutors were so angry that the judge had done this that they appealed the case and it went, off, went back to the Court of Appeals and they reinstated his conviction and sent him back to prison to finish his life term. That's it's true. almost unheard of. And so I've talked to innocence people, innocence groups, we've never heard of that. Richard is innocent, we want to try to give him a voice, we want to go back into federal court and habeas corpus and expose the Brady violations, which are hiding evidence, and expose the essentially false confessions that these witnesses were coerced into making. So now you call it educating the public, right? but I think it's fair to say that the way that you do that is some sort of media. Am I correct? I, I would, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially like I would do with any client, whatever the business was. Who are your public audiences? Who, who's talking? Who do we want to reach? So it's not just the media, but the media is one vehicle. It's also now with the internet. It's social networking. It's, it's Facebook. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's media in the, in the broadest sense. But I also want to reach those public audiences. I want to reach the local elected officials. I want to reach other, in Richie's case, I want to re reach the police unions. I want to reach other people to find support, people that will understand, people that are going to raise their voice and also provide a transparency. That's mostly what we're asking for. Take a look at the case. Take another look. Judge, jury, appeals court, federal court, take another look at this case. That's really interesting work, I have to say. <laughs> I can't imagine fighting that, considering the number of media outlets that heavily scrutinize so many trials. As you say, they are completely in the public eye. But um, another case that you've been working on that I know you are also very familiar with is the West Memphis Three case. And you do a lot of work dealing mainly with false confessions and trying to educate the public in that sense. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the West Memphis Three case and the, the role that you played? Sure. It was when I came onto the case, and just quickly, the West Memphis Three, three little children were brutally murdered in 1993, dumped in a drainage ditch in West Memphis, Arkansas, which sort of deliverance, <laughs> you know. And three young men in town, Damien Eccles being uh, one of them, who was, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, the smartest kid in town, you know, uh, wore black, became a great target for the police. And he was arrested along with Jesse, uh, Miss Kelly, and uh, Jason, his other friend. And Jesse, uh, who was a, a young man who was disabled, who was an acquaintance of theirs, was brought into the police station. And after 12 hours of questioning, Jesse uh, confessed, falsely confessed. In fact, we know it was a false confession because Jesse was told, uh, said that he, he helped murder these three children at 9 in the morning. There's just one problem with his comments. At 9 in the morning, the kids were in public school. And right then, but the cops, you know, said, well, they, they, they didn't really care the fact that Jesse had made a mistake. They came back a later and said, well, Jesse, you mean 12 o'clock? Yeah, lunchtime. Jesse said, yeah, we murdered them at 12 o'clock. Then the police realized that they weren't out at that hour, so they, just, they went back and said, Jesse, you mean 6.30 or 7? And go, Jesse goes, yeah, it was 8 o'clock that night. And that was enough to get an indictment, and the other two kids were, were brought to trial. Jesse's confession, coerced false confession, was in the newspapers before the trial. And Jesse was convicted and sentenced to life. Jason was convicted and sentenced to life. And Demian Eccles was convicted and sentenced to death based on that false confession. So 
in an ideal world, if you would have been <laughs> able to step in in 1993, what would you have done differently? You know, it's a great question, and I and I on every case I work on, whether it's a wrongful conviction or even a civil case, often I think, and and you know, what if I was there then? I wish I was there then. It's very unique. You know, lawyers aren't looking for, hey, I need some media consulting, right? That's why I say it's akin to malpractice if an attorney has a case and doesn't look at the public issues. They must. What I would have done then was, first of all, the idea that Jesse's false confession or Jesse's confession. Had, was in the newspapers before uh, he was put on trial, I would have been there pointing out the discrepancies in his confession. I would not have, I would have called that newspaper up and I said, you're putting that in there? First of all, it was leaked by the prosecutors or the police, obviously. Nobody else had the confession. And I said, okay, let's go over the discrepancies. Right then and there, maybe I could have saved, well, I don't want to say I could have saved them, but just pointing out that his confession had, you know, he, quote, confessed at, you know, to killing the kids at nine in the morning would have raised some doubt in some juror's mind, right? We only need one juror yeah. to, to, like to, to have a reasonable, you know, reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt. There you go. Yeah. Now, I know that you were mentioning before that there's, uh, there's a large difference between a police investigation or an interrogation where the police investigators are consistently asking a witness or a potential witness, and then what happened? as opposed to the Jelly, uh, Jesse Miss Kelly situation where it was, and then it was at noon, right? And then it was at 3.30. How do you think that really affects somebody who isn't disabled? I mean, it, it obviously still happens. You know, it happens all the time. In fact, it happens a lot in New York State. New York State, you know, big liberal state. And in fact, when I met Damian Eccles on death row in Arkansas, he said to me, boy, it must be, you're from New York, you know, it must be really different in there. You have Andrew Cuomo, right, and he's the governor, and. And it's, you know, he, he thought I was going to say, and I said, the only thing different in New York is the accents. The prosecutors aren't any different. They still, and New York has one of the highest rates of wrongful convictions of any state in the country. It also has 50% of the wrongful convictions in New York State involved a false confession. So it's a, it's a, a rampant problem. It's a problem that still exists. Courts get them every day. I get calls from lawyers almost weekly saying, I have a case, I think my client falsely confessed, I need help. New York State is another state which rarely allows false confession experts into the courtroom. And there are some great experts right in New York, Saul Kasson at, 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 uh, at uh, John Jay College and Richard Leo in San Francisco, and there's some wonder Steve Drizzen in, in, in Chicago, some great experts about this phenomena. And it happens. Jesse's case is a prime example. Marty Tankliff, very well-known case in New York. His parents were murdered. High school, he was only 16, but he was an educated, wealthy Jewish kid from Long Island. Uh, you wouldn't think he would, be, he would falsely confess. But the scenario was created by the police where the only rational answer is, I must have done it. In Marty's case, which is really fascinating, they said to him, Marty, we found your, mother, your hair wrapped around your mother's dead fingernails. We found your father, who his father survived for just a few weeks and he was in a coma. And the police said to him, this was in a, you know, only hours after Mar Mar Marty found his parents dead. And he was brought to the precinct. So they said, Marty, we just got a call from the hospital. Your we shot your father with adrenaline. The doctors shot your father with adrenaline. He was awakened from his coma. And he said, you attacked him. Now, Marty was sitting there going, you're telling me my hair was wrapped around my mother's dead fingernails. My father said that I attacked him. They also told him about they found, st they found blood or something in the shower. He, they said, could you have blacked out? And Marty said, I must have. That was all it took. They said, another Marty. He said, maybe another Marty. You know, they created an environment where the only rational answer was, I must have blacked out. They lied to him. They were all lies. Marty's father didn't wake up. His hair was not found in his mother's fingernails. There was no blood in any of the drains, the seven bathrooms in the house. There was no blood, in, there was no evidence anywhere. And he never even saw his confection. He, was, he would, did not sign it. He was Mirandized after he confessed. And eight months later at, his, at, his, at a hearing over the validity of the confession was the first time he saw it. It was written by the police at some point, either that day or five months later. Wow. That's pretty remarkable. It's unfortunate. Marty spent 18 years in prison before his case was overturned. Wow. And he, was he fully exonerated? 
he was, well, you know, there's very rare that somebody's fully, you know, there's no exoneration law. I mean, judges can say, okay, they overturned his conviction and, they, and the prosecutors didn't uh, prose re-prosecute. Okay. But okay. he has a civil case. He's, yes, he's essentially exonerated. Everybody, everybody knows it. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit different from <laughs> the West Memphis Three, right, who took the Alford plea. Well, it was, yeah, in the West Memphis Three case, um, as I always said, and I said to the time, you know, we finally, and it was almost shocking because nobody thought this would happen, the Arkansas Supreme Court ruled seven to zero to reopen the case. They didn't overturn the conviction, but the, they, they, remand, they, re, they didn't reverse, they remanded, they remanded back to the local court, which had, same judge had, la, had been on the case for 18 years and refused to hear any of the new evidence. And we were moving towards a new hearing, which essentially would have been like a trial. We had new evidence, we had investigators, everybody was, we were introducing issues like false confessions to the, to the, to the jury pool, <laughs> you know, maybe the prosecutor was right. You know, we were, we were priming that, you know, that pump on, on the innocence issues. And, but at the same time, it's so hard to get an innocent man or woman out of prison. It's so hard to overturn a conviction. Anything can happen. And at the time, Steve Braga, who was our lead attorney, and Patrick uh, uh, Banker, who was our local attorney, came up with the idea, you know, let's talk to the prosecutors. They wanted that case out of Arkansas. Like, get these guys out of here. So they came up with a sort of a novel agreement, which was this Alford plea, where they made, the young men maintain their innocence, but essentially agree to time served. Now, some people thought that was, was unfortunate. And yes, it is unfortunate. But you know what? Damien Eccles on death row and these other three kids, anything could have happened to them. In fact, I spoke to the prosecutor the other night because we're still working together and he has agreed. Even though he, quote, believes these kids are guilty because he essentially has to, he got an agreement of their guilt, he is willing to review new evidence in the case and we're supplying new evidence. We want to get a complete exoneration. That's but what, it, what he said to me, and it's true, is those kids would still be in jail today if you guys didn't agree to that Alfred plea. Because even if he got a new trial, we would have kept them, we wouldn't have granted bail, and got, anything could have happened. Well, it's kind of a similar situation to the DiGuglielmo the De yeah, case, case, right? Because just the natural time for appeals, all of that, you know, he was out for two years, whereas these kids very likely would have been held in prison they for would, another. Likely. In fact, I asked the prosecutor that question. I said, did, just the other night, I said, does, did the Arkansas law bar uh, bail? He said, I'm not sure if it bars bail, but we usually don't give bail on a capital case. It was a capital murder case. Damien was on death row. So the chances are they would not have gotten bail, even if the, I mean, the judge probably could have pushed it through, but he may not have, you know, in terms of political reasons. And, well, and you know. I, that was actually going to be my next question was <laughs> the political climates and, you know, the difference between New York and Arkansas. Arkansas is a much smaller state. I feel like it's maybe perhaps a little bit more easily influenced by some of those political agendas. And I'm like, I think that we, it was, I don't think we would have gotten this decision. We, literally from the time we proposed the Alfred plea to the time they were out of prison was about two weeks. I mean, I can't imagine that happening in New York. It was more like, you know, it was like, you know, uh, what was that movie, uh, uh, you know, I forgot. But it was like, hey, you want to make a deal? You want your boy out of prison? Let's make a deal, you know, cool hand Luke. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. And that's what happened. But back to the political issues. I mean, New York has the, is one of the states with the highest number of wrongful convictions. Prosecutors are loath to free innocent men. They put a ba uh, you know, one block after another. You have to fight to get DNA tested. I mean, the Supreme Court has ruled, the federal government has, has an innocence law that says defendants have a right to test their DNA. But to get that through, and New York prosecutors, uh, whether it's you know, the Brooklyn prosecutor or the Manhattan prosecutor, they all go to these innocence conferences, and, they all, and judges as well, and they all talk about, in, including Jonathan Littman, our, our Court of Appeals judge, big wrongful conviction advocate. When Richard de Guglielmo's case went before him, he ruled against it. I mean, why? Take a look at the case. Realize how hard it is to overturn a conviction. It's really the judges that have to change, and the system. Prosecutors are sort of, you know, you can't change them. They will do anything to get him, you know. Although it's kind of funny, in the West Memphis Three case, the prosecutor I've been working with, Scott Ellington, is, is uh, he didn't have that case. So he didn't have what they say, the horse in the race. So he's a little different. Uh, but, you know, we're still, it's a real struggle. You know, the Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman, who's been a big promoter of wrongful convictions. Right. Leg right. Legislation just instituted a uh, wrongful conviction unit in the Attorney General's office. Do you think that will be effective? 
I think it's very important. You know, it's hard, you know, it's hard to be effective. I, I've consulted with them. There's a young man who's the director named Blake Zeff, who's a terrific young guy, who's uh, co-head of that unit and really wants to do the right thing. I think it can be a model. And we can develop some best practices and, uh, you know, hopefully free an innocent man or take a look at a case. So I think it's important. Uh, it's not going to change the world, but uh, it's so hard to get that in there. It's so hard. And again, I think it's up. Uh, I think change comes through the judges. I think the Court of Appeals, the, these judges have to it's say, we're not going to just let these cases go. When there's a question about a confession, we're going we're gonna to ask the prosecutors. We're going to make the prosecutors prove his case, not just gloss over it, not just let the jury. Juries are not sophisticated enough. They're uneducated, you know, as I, I try to do. I've got to educate the juries. We, you know, and it really is incumbent upon the judges to make a difference, but they haven't, either in New York or Arkansas, and I'm not optimistic. I think probably one of the most obvious criticisms that some people might have of your work is that there's a potential that you're putting out a potentially guilty man freed from prison. I mean, what do you say to that? Do you think that most of these confessions are, in fact, false? Or I know that some Well, you know, I mean, that's confess. why, they, listen, the Supreme Court, Miranda v. Arizona, there's a reason they had that. Supreme Court says a confession, true or false, is some of the most powerful evidence that a jury could be presented with. So you have to have things in place. There needs to be laws, there needs to be regulations that say custodial interrogations are videotaped. Um, they have to allow experts into the courtroom. That educates the jury. In New York State, we don't allow false confession experts in, rarely. I mean, I could, probably on one hand you can count them. And I get calls every day from around the state on false confessions. So the judge has got to step up. Jonathan Lippmann's got to step up. He talks about wrongful conviction legislation or you know, issues. But, you know, he could make, he could, he could certainly recommend it as a leader of this, the state court can talk about judges saying, we need to look at false confessions, but they don't. I, I think it's a real failure in the system uh, that they're not. As far as for me, I want to put all the information out there. If I create a website, as we did in the West Memphis case, as we did in Marty Tankliff's case, Richard Dugliamo's case, Jesse Friedman, another case I'm working on, I'll put the prosecutor's, uh, uh, you know, uh, legal files as well as our legal files. Every filing, prosecutor, defense, should go on there. Let people decide. Let's provide transparency. Let journalists look at it. The other important part, half of these cases, you know, I just spoke to Bruce Lambert, who was a New York Times journalist, who wrote like 40 articles about the Marty Tankliff case. And, uh, you know, he exposed, you know, the, the, the evidence. That's all we're asked. Let's look at the evidence. Your question about... People ask me all the time, how do you, including my wife, how do you know he's innocent? <laughs> it takes about five minutes. Yeah. I swear. Look at a case. You know, you look at a case. Look at a filing. Look at the original indictment. You just look at it and you go, what? You know, one witness who, who, who said this at, and then changed their testimony after meeting with the police and being threatened. Something's wrong here. You know, and again, there's, not everybody is, in, you know, listen. People walk around and everybody in prison says they're innocent. No, they don't. The ones working in the law library, the ones, the guys, that men, men and women who are working to turn their cases over, who are filing, who are, who are spending their time on it, those are likely the ones that are innocent. And the other thing is people have been over-prosecuted. You know, we constantly talk about cases where they just throw everything out there. Depraved indifference, second degree murder, you know, whatever they can. It's like, let's just get somebody convicted. As opposed to, what about justice? Where's the justice? I agree. I know that with advancements in DNA technology and you know the amount of evidence that can be collected from a crime scene nowadays is doesn't even compare to what could have been collected in 1993. But how do you think the physical evidence weighs against defendants in addition to the false confessions? Do you think that it it weighs more heavily, or do you think that once a false confession is made, they're fighting an uphill battle? You know, it's a, it, it's a great question. Yes. That's, again, back to, you know, Miranda v. Arizona. Once there's a confession, once information is presented to the jury, it almost always ends up in a conviction. Jeffrey Deskovich, well-known case in New York. Jeffrey uh, was convicted of murder and rape of a classmate of his, also in Westchester County. And uh, although at the crime scene, the rape kit had somebody else's DNA. So even at the time of his trial, 
Even though somebody else's DNA was in the rape kit, he was convicted based on his false confession. Wow. He was a young kid. He was a troubled teenager. He, quote, wanted to help. The police said, sure, come on in. And 15 hours later, or how many hours later, he was, you know, lying in a fetal position underneath the, underneath the, the table that he was, and falsely confessing to a crime he didn't do. It took 15 years, 16 years in his case, for them to go back in the Innocence Project, retest the DNA. By this time, they had a match. The person that was, whose DNA was had gone on to rape and murder another woman. Wow. So every time there's a wrongful conviction, there's a guilty person in our streets. That's absolutely unbelievable. And the DNA was there. The physical evidence was there, not tying him to the case. C very conclusive physical evidence. But the jury convicted him. And the prosecutors knew it. I mean, well, so, hell, you know, let's hide it. You know, don't tell the jury about the DNA. Yeah, let's hide the ball. You know, and if you don't have a good lawyer, you don't, in, in many cases, you know, you don't have good uh, representation. That's what I find. I think the lawyer and the law firms really have a responsibility. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, I tell you, I was working on a case of a guy by the name of Derek Hamilton. Clear wrongful conviction, spent 20 years in prison fighting his case. He became a jailhouse lawyer. And it was a struggle for him to get representation. And, you know, I tried to find, you know, I went to some, you know, to get pro bono help from. And finally, he got a lot of, got a lot of help from attorneys, but they couldn't really spend the time they, you know, you needed. You needed a big law firm. In Damien Eccles' case, we had Ropes and Gray and Steve Braga. Marty's case, we had five major law firms donating their time pro bono. In Derek Hamilton's case, poor black guy from Bed-Stuy, you know, the law firms weren't lining up going, oh, we'll take that case. You know, Derek had some priors. You know, he was a street guy, uh, but he was innocent. He spent 20 years. That was a crime. That's the crime. So my message to the law firms, all the law firms that come to New York Law School to recruit all you smart young lawyers, please ratchet up that pro bono department. And don't, you know, I mean, they all have them. And they all, you know, they all go to the Innocence Project dinners and they all contribute $500 or $1,000 or whatever. But, you know, give it to those law firms. Well, step up. Well, Skadden Arps, step up. Go. And they're great. Skadden Arps is great. I mean, they're on the board of the Innocence Project. Step up more. You know, go, go into those. There's hundreds of wrongful convictions, thousands, probably tens of thousands. And also, don't take those cases that just look good. You know, don't you, Marty's a nice Jewish kid from Long Island. Derek Hamilton was a black guy from Bed-Stuy who had priors. He deserved pro bono help. He would have been out years ago. Well, I hate to cut you off, but <laughs> this has been a pleasure. I'm so happy that you were able to join us. But uh, I hope you can come back again. Absolutely. Anytime. This was fun. Thanks. Thank you for joining us tonight on Media Reporter. I'm Megan Lalone. Have a great night, New York. Got it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>